steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light, pressing more closely to him who is leading when we are tempted to turn from the way. Trusting the arm that is strong to defend us. Happy, how happy our praises each day. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Led in paths of light. Walking in footsteps of gentle forbearance, footsteps of faithfulness, mercy, and love. Looking to him for the grace freely promised, happy, how happy our journey above. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light. Stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Good to see you here tonight. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we ask you, as always, that you'd bless the preaching, the singing, the special, and Lord, give us something for, to take home with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We will be singing This World Is Not My Home, number 485. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I don't know if you've ever lost track of time on a church day and looked at the clock at the last minute and realized, rut row. That was where Brother Block was at today. I, I spent the whole day just studying on my sermon and messing with stuff, and I was on the computer, and I looked at the computer after talking to someone on the phone, and it said 6.40, and I thought, oh my. So I ran in, shaved real quick, grabbed my toothbrush, stuck it in my mouth, took the dog out while I was brushing my teeth, came back in, threw on my clothes, hurried to church. I pulled out of the driveway at 10.52, so I thought, that's good. Then I got behind slow people on the highway. It never fails. And I, you're in a hurry. I was behind slow people. So uh, if, if it looks like I'm out of breath, I am. I didn't even catch my breath in the 20-minute drive to church. I'm still I'm so, so out of breath that uh, that happens when you get old and out of shape. So don't forget to pray for all these people. Now, again, we, we mention these folks regularly. We also want you to pray for them regularly. So don't forget to always pray.
19th and 20th of August. That's a Friday night and a Saturday. Uh, and then we have Brother uh, Coral coming in September. Now we're going to take, Brother Nicholas gave me permission to take up love offerings. Um, Liberty Baptist Church, we're using Texas Baptist's facilities, but Kurt and I and our workers are doing most of the work uh, and kind of, kind of in charge of youth conference that will be coming up uh, in, like I said, in August. But uh, he, Brother Nicholas said that we could take up a love offering or two because we have to pay for half of the speaker and part of the hotel. Now, the teenagers sold a bunch of candy, uh, which will help buy, buy the food and the drinks and all the stuff that goes with uh, youth conference. And then we'll have a meeting tonight after church for any adults and teens that can help us. We'll start giving you some things that we can start doing to be ready for youth conference. Uh, but again, uh, we have several churches that we've contacted and more that we'll be contacting. So I pray that youth conference will. We have a brother, Jeff Owens. He's a really good preacher. I, I, I've, I've that, that first time I heard him preach in person, I've read some of his books in the past. But last year at youth conference was the first time I'd ever heard him preach in person. Uh, and he'll be with us again, preaching one time Friday night and two times on Saturday. So if you would uh, keep that in prayer, we'd appreciate it. Don't forget the normal stuff going on this week, which means tomorrow night, 645 for soul winning. Uh, and then Friday, youth activity, 6 to 7.30. Saturday, bus visitation at 9.30, so when at 10.45. Then back on our place for Sunday school at 9.45, church at 10.50. Uh, again, always pray for our country as well and for our men and women defending our country. Uh, I don't know where Josh, Josh is going to be deployed because he can't tell me, but he'll be deployed in September. Uh, I'll let you know when, when that comes up for sure. But he was in, what was that place, Mrs. Bell? He was at last week? Djibouti. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's spelled. I, I mean, I had him spell it to me, and I said that didn't really help because I think it starts with a D, and I wouldn't think Djibouti would be spelled with a D. But he was, he was, I said, never heard of it. He said, have you ever heard of Somalia? And I said, I have heard of that. I watched Black Hawk Down, not, not a good place. He said when they pulled in the, flew into the airport, it looked like it had just been bombed. I said, maybe it has. And he said, no, that's just, I guess the runway and everything just looks that way in some of those third world countries. But he was over there last week in California this week getting ready for deployment. So if you'd keep him in prayer, we'd appreciate it. Please stand as we sing number 495, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Same song. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray, and holy men will be showered all around. Brethren, see poor sinners round you slumbering on the brink of woe. Death is coming, hell is moving, can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray, and holy men will be showered all around. Sisters, will you join and help us? Moses' sister aided him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about the Savior. Tell that he will be found. Sisters, pray, and holy men will be showered all around. Taken up for youth conference. If you can help with that, the teens and I would appreciate it. Let's pray, Father, as you bless this offering tonight, bless the giver and the those that receive it, Lord. I pray, Father, you just bless this service tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen.
we will be singing 312, Rejoice in the Lord. God never moves without purpose or plan when drawing his servants and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth the soul. O oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day, then peace came and tears fled away. O oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Now I can see, testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in his care. Through purging more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold.
Turn your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. How many of you have ever been to a missions baseball game? I've uh, been trying to schedule one. I kept calling the ticket office. Of course, they send you to a, a big ticket place, and I didn't want to buy the tickets at regular price. I was hoping they used to. They had a, something in the newspaper. It would be called like family night or something. You get, you get tickets for just a few dollars a piece, and that was when I like to go when they're a few dollars a piece. So I called to ask what the group rates were, and it was anywhere from 13 to $25. And I thought, ouch, that's tough for a family of four, five, or six to go. So I went by a couple of days ago and asked them if they had, and they said they have a $2 Tuesday. And I, I like the sound of that. So I have 40 tickets for August the 2nd. Now I'll put out a sign up sheet, hopefully after church tonight, if I remember, with all the other stuff going on. But uh, you can sign up how many tickets you want. Uh, there, again, you're not going to find them any cheaper than that. Uh, but And we already have our seats. Used to when we would get the people would give us seats, they'd give us a, a ticket, like uh, maybe, maybe uh, some of the folks that worked at um, some of the businesses, their business would give them a bunch of free tickets. We had to show up and just find a seat. I mean, it was one of those you allowed, you was allowed to sit in a certain section. It was first come, first serve. So we had to show up early. In this case, we actually have our section and our role and our seat all reserved. We paid for those seats so nobody can take them. So... We don't have to get there early, but again, and you don't have to, no matter what age you are, if you enjoy, ba- now it's not like the, the pros, needless to say, this is double A, but they actually play, at last time, I haven't seen them for quite some time, but last time they played, they, they played fairly well, pretty good team, uh, so, and for $2, you can't beat that, I don't think anyone, if you have five kids, you can't go in here for $10 anymore, so, now I, I can't tell you what the price of, of the hot dog will be, and the soda pop will be, and the corn dog will be, that'll probably be about $50 a piece, but uh, that's called, it's called eat before you come, uh, or hope, hopefully, I, I don't know if they check purses or not to check if you're taking in food and drinks, so I, I can't give you any advice about that, uh, but we will, we do have tickets, and if we need more, I can get some more. She just said if I need more tickets, I need to do it fairly quick, and that way, because we're all sitting together right now, and that make it nice so we don't, uh, and again, some of our folks do not sit down. In my youth, I used to chase the foul balls as well. I stand in the back, catch the foul balls, and give them to kids. In my old age, I just sit and enjoy the ball game. So, uh, but again, if you want to go chase baseballs, you're welcome to it. Uh, but uh, that will be August the 2nd. The game starts at 7.05. John chapter 8 in your Bibles. Now, we've been speaking of character things. And, the, from the, and again, the fellow that will be speaking at our conference uh, in August is the young man that wrote this book, that wrote the books on character. I had one years ago. Uh, and then last year at youth conference, picked up another one. He had more character. Uh, one before was, was a book on Christian character, and then this was simply called More Christian Character. But tonight we'll speak on something that, that probably no matter how old we are or how young we are, we all have these, and it's called this, Character and Breaking Bad Habits. Character and Breaking Bad Habits. See, Brother Block, you got any bad habits? Of course I do. Probably you do too. That's just simply uh, the human nature, uh, and it's a good thing to work to try to break those bad habits. Some are harder to break than others. He told a story, and it's a very sad story. He said that um, he was dealing with a young lady about her alcohol problem, and one day she showed up unannounced, knocked on his window, and she was in a drunken stupor, and he just went out and was amazed, went out and talked to her and said, he, he called her by name, and he said, you have to stop drinking. And she said, you don't understand, preacher, how hard it is for me to stop drinking. She said, I've been drinking since I was two years old. She said, my mother and my father would go to parties when I was a baby, and they would put a liquor in my, in my bottle and give it to me. I would get drunk, and they would, they would laugh at my drunken antics as I, as, as I did stuff there at the party. She said, I've been drinking since I was two years old. It's not easy to stop drinking when you've been drinking since you was two. She then went on to say, uh, a few years after that, my parents departed and left me with my grandma and my grandpa. They were raising me. I had no one else in the world besides my grandma and grandpa. In the middle of in the, in my young years, my 10, 11, 12 years of age, my grandma passed. I only had my grandpa to continue to raise me, the only one that, that loved me and cared about me. A year later, her grandfather passed. She told nobody her grandfather had passed. Uh, she, she sat by his bedside and clung to his body for three days before the paramedics came in and found out uh, someone had reported a, a very bad smell. They had to pry her fingers off of her grandpa's body and pull her away, and she was screaming, no, no, I have no one left. And so uh, she, was, she ran away, lived out on the streets for a while, and he, she told him this story. She said, one day, she said, I wanted to kill myself, so I sniffed some hairspray, and I got high. I slipped both my wrists, and I jumped off a railroad trestle and, and hit the ground below. The problem was, she said, I, I still lived, 
The medics found me. They sewed up my stitches. They took me to a, to a juvenile delinquent home. She said, after they walked out that evening, I took the scissors and cut my stitches back out. I just wanted to die. And he said, no matter how bad that sounds, he said, there's always hope because he said, that young lady today is a godly Christian young lady that's grown up living for the Lord. So he said, no matter what your habit is, and by the way, you might have a habit that's very devastating like hers, or you might just have one that, uh, uh, that's something that you've been struggling and fighting with and, and, and the devil and you have been going back and forth on. Uh, but again, we'll look tonight at, at breaking bad habits, character and breaking bad habits. Let's pray. Father, I ask you for your help and your wisdom. Pray, Lord, you'd help me to get across the thoughts that you've given in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it mentions in John chapter 8, notice verse 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, we're talking about breaking habits and being free. Notice verse 36 in the same chapter, John chapter 8. Notice verse 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, he said there's no true freedom other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, um, we'll see several things in that. And he's gonna, he said he, he wanted to liken freedom to the Egyptian bondage. It's easier to understand. So he's gonna, we're going to use the Egyptian bondage, the children of Israel under bondage to the, to the Egyptians, uh, illustrate the truth tonight. Step number one, he said, in breaking a bad habit is you have to admit that you have a bad habit. Now, I don't know that that would be very hard for most of us because most of us are fairly knowledgeable of the Bible. And we realize that Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, as, is, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. So the truth is we're all sinners. And all those sins, by the way, when you and I do a sin repeatedly, you know what we could call that? A habit. Now, there are good habits, so not all habits need to be broken. For instance, some of you have a habit of reading your Bible every day. That's a good habit. Some of you have a habit of coming to church every time the doors are open. That's a good habit. Some of you have a habit of, 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 of again, of maybe tithing or soul winning or passing out tracts. There's lots of good habits you can have. Uh, but besides those good habits, there's also some bad habits we can have. And the Christian life is a continual work on working on this body, on this flesh, and making it more like Christ on a day-by-day basis. So that, again, is what he said. He said, first you have to admit that you have a bad habit. Now, I can tell you, if you've ever knocked doors and went soul winning, there are people out there that will tell you they're not that bad. Now, they won't admit they're perfect, but they'll try to tell you that I'm not that bad. Now, what that's implying is uh, there are other people out there that probably need this worse than me. Now, sometimes you'll be around teenagers, and you'll deal with somebody, and one of them smart aleck, and you give that, you start so in, and one of them will say, he really needs it, I mean, and they'll, they'll mock. Now, by the way, usually that whole group needs it, but they're talking about one person in particular because they'll say, yeah, I mean, you better talk to him because he's really bad. Uh, and the truth is... Uh, Every sinner is, a bad, is bad. There's no such thing as a good sinner. Uh, but again, breaking bad habits, the first thing you have to do is admit that you have a bad habit. Again, we're likening it to bondage. So the second step is to, again, we must practice the law of freedom. Go in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, we said we're going to show you that the children of Israel were in bondage. In Exodus chapter 12, notice verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. Now this is coming about because several plagues have, have came upon the Egyptians and the Egyptians still, still hold the children of Israel. The Egyptian uh, Pharaoh, the Egyptian king still holds the children of Israel in bondage and refuses. Now Moses had said, God said, let my people go. What he said is give them freedom. And again, now he was willing to give them a little freedom. You can go out and party. You can go outside of town and, and offer sacrifices, and you can, you can depart for a little ways, but you've got you to leave your, your stuff here and so on and so forth. He gave them some concessions. None of them were what God wanted. What God wanted was the children of Israel set free. Now, plague after plague had happened. So again, understand, when we're talking about the law of bondage, again, the children of Israel are in that law of bondage. They need something to offset that. Notice verse 12. It says, for I passed through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. Skip down to verse 33. Notice what happens. Now that happened. The, the blood was applied. And those who obeyed the Lord, they didn't lose the firstborn. But, but again, all the Egyptians did, and probably some of the Israelites who did not apply the blood did. Notice verse 33. And the Egyptians were urging upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said... We be all dead men. What they said is, get out, get out, hurry up and get out. Now, before they've been telling the children of Israel, you can't, you, you can't leave, you must stay. But now the children of Israel are set free. Uh, they, again, now, again, the, the Egyptians were the law of bondage. Notice 
there in verse 33 it says, it said, the Egyptians were, were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land, for they said, we'd be all dead men. What they meant was, we're all, we, they thought they were all going to die. Now, I don't know uh, how you would feel. I know how I would feel if I lost any of my children. But usually your firstborn, uh, especially back in the, in the Jewish times, the firstborn was the most important child. He got two parts of the inheritance. Every other child, every other son got one part. So if there's five children, dad would split the land up in six parts. The one boy would get two-sixths. Each of the others would get one-sixth. If there was three children, they split it up in four pieces. Uh, the, the oldest would get two-fourths, and the other, each of the others would get one-fourth. The eldest son was the one that carried on. Now, again, all parents, especially all men, I don't know how ladies are because I've never been a lady, so I can't speak for ladies, but uh, you know what men like? Men like to have a son so that the, the son can carry on the family name so that the family name, the Block, or the Taylor, or the Smith, or the Reese, so that name continues on. For the Parks, I'm so sorry. There's going to be less Parks in the, in the world in the future. But again, uh, those who have girls, again, uh, they usually get married. They take on, they take on their husband's name, so they no longer are, are the, the, the original family name. But again, the son carries on the family name. Now, the children of Israel were in bondage. But God topped that. God set them free. Now, to break a habit, we must claim the law of freedom. What we mean is find a scripture, claim a scripture that goes with that. Notice Romans chapter 7 in your Bibles, Romans chapter 7. Notice what Paul said. He asked a question, then he answered it in the very next verse. Romans 7 verse 24 said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, what he says is, who's going to deliver me? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, and with the flesh the law of sin. What he said is, I can tell you who's going to set me free. God's going to set me free. Now I can tell you, those of us that are under the bondage of sin and on our way to hell, what happened was when we got saved, we got that law, we got that law of freedom. Uh, Christ saved us and set us free from that law of bondage. Now I said claim a scripture. In order to, when you think about a rocket ship going to the, to the sky, you have to realize that rocket ship can't get out of our atmosphere without breaking a gravity barrier. And so it has to have those thrusters that, that's able to push it past. Otherwise, it would, hit that, it would hit that spot and it would just burn up right there. Uh, by the way, coming back, it's the same way. It has to break that gravity barrier around the earth. You and I must claim a scripture. Now, he mentioned this, and this, if you get nothing else, get this truth tonight. Because if you want to break a bad habit, this, again, I, I know people that say, I've been praying, asking God to, to take it away from me. Uh, here's what you have to understand. The Bible prescription will only work together with the effort put forth by the individual who wants to be free. Now get that. The Bible prescription will only work together with the effort put forth by the individual who wants to be free. If you, if you want to be free and you just expect God to do all of it, that's not how it works. You want to break a bad habit? Uh, by the way, God will give you strength and God will help you, but you've got to work at it. I know folks that have been trying to give up cigarettes for years. and Thankfully, I never got addicted to cigarettes. Uh, the truth is, cigarettes uh, make me cough. I hate the smell of cigarettes. Uh, and, and today, they're so expensive, I can't even imagine people who are addicted to two and three and four packs of cigarettes, how they can afford to eat in today's economy. But again, um, I know folks who have given up smoking cigarettes dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Sometimes they quit for a week or two. Sometimes they stop for a month or two, but they always went back to it. Now, again, understand, they have to, they have to ask God for help, claim a scripture, and then they're going to have to apply these other steps that we'll give you in a moment. There's four other steps. But again, you've got to make sure that you put forth the effort that's needed for you to be free. So, again, God doesn't do it by himself. Now, he could, but if he did that, you and I would be a bunch of welfare Christians. We just ask God for everything, and we just sit around and just get spiritually fat. By the way... Um, we can pray and ask God to help us win a soul to the Lord. But notice what I said, help us win a soul to the Lord. We got to go out and knock on the doors and pass out tracks and talk to people. We can pray and ask God to help us build the bus route or a Sunday school class. But again, if we want that to happen, we got to go out and knock on some doors and, and talk to some people. God will help us. God wants that to happen. But God wants us to do our part in that happening. So again, I said, again, we must claim a scripture. The third step is called practice law of total separation. Notice Exodus chapter 14. Again, we're talking about the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 14, notice verse 13. Practice the law of total separation. Exodus 14, 13 says, As Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and shall hold you peace. Now, Say, what happened? Notice verse 28. 
And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Now that, that did two things. One, it, it set the children of Israel free. It separated them from Egypt. Now the Red Sea is between them. Also, by the way, it made it very, very hard for, the, for them to ever go back. Think about it. If they decided, I want to go back to Egypt, the Egyptians are not going to be very happy with them. They already lost their firstborn. Now they've lost a bunch of their soldiers and a bunch of their leaders are wiped out. They weren't, they, they weren't probably too keen on the children of Israel coming back and settling back in. Say, what did God do? God made it hard for them to go back. You know what they had to do? They had to keep going forward. They had to keep heading to the promised land where God intended for them to go. So we practice the law of total separation. Notice in your Bibles, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Jesus makes this statement in verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now here's what he said. I want you to put your eyes on me, and I don't want you to keep looking back. Now I can tell you... Uh, if you've been like me, you've watched TV shows where some bad guy was chasing someone through the woods. And you know what always happens? The person always does what? They look back to see the person chasing them. And then what happens? Then they fall. They always trip because they look back. Uh, now, I don't know if they'd outrun the bad guy if they'd have just faced the front. But I can guarantee you they had a better chance than turning around and looking back. Because when you look back, what it means is you're not looking where you're going. Sometimes we bump into someone and we'll say, sorry, I wasn't watching where I was going. By the way, that's why you have eyes in the front of your head instead of the back of your head. Now, I know that parents, for some reason, parents are allotted the, the belief that they have eyes in the back of their head, okay? My mama used to tell me, I'd say, how'd you know that? She said, I have eyes in the back of my head. Um, but uh, the truth is, she really didn't. Uh, she was just smart and knew, knew my nature, knew my brother's nature, so she could figure it out fairly well. But we have eyes in front of us so that we can see the path in front of us. So again, uh, we want to make sure that we realize that once God gives us a path, we stop looking back. By the way, stop looking back, hoping you could go back, or wanting to go back, or desiring those things. Notice in your Bibles, Exodus chapter 14, notice verse 26. Exodus 14, verse 26. Now I said we have to practice the law of total separation. God made it impossible for the children of Israel to turn back. Verse 26 of, of Exodus 14 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stress out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again into, upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. Now, if you know anything about it, the children of Israel could not have got across the Red Sea on their own. The only reason they got across the Red Sea from that side to this side, because God walled the water up and blew the wind across there and let them walk across on dry ground. Say, that's impossible. It is, but God does the impossible. Impossible is not impossible for God. It's only impossible for you and I. Yes, I could not have held the water back and dried up the ground, uh, but God could, and He did. But once, that, once the children of Israel got across, He now put the Red Sea back between the children of Israel. You know why? He did not want them going back. He didn't want them. He brought them out of Egypt for a reason. He wanted them to be His chosen people and to go on and continue to do the things that He, he had planned for them. Step four, we must practice the law of replacement. Notice in your Bibles, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers, again, we're looking at the children of Israel, using them as an example here. Numbers chapter 11, notice verse 5. They sat around in the evening, and here's what they said. We remember the fish, which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. I don't know if you've noticed that. Most of those things stink. I had never paid attention, but when you think about it, the, I mean, the, the fish stink. I, the leeks and the onions and the garlic all stink. Um, I bet their sweat smelled. I bet you could smell them when they, I mean, when Daddy came home from work. I mean, you could tell for he came through the door because he stunk. Well, here's what they were doing. They was remembering how good it used to be, the things that they had given up. Now, I said they have to practice the law of replacement. They gave up something. You say, what did God give them? Well, notice what he gave them in your Bibles. Notice Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, notice verse 6. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Verse 17. Of, I'm sorry, verse 7. And the manna was a coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of thalidium. Now, he gave them manna eat to eat. He replaced what they had with something else. Now, when I say we must practice the law of replacement, many Christians give up something. But if you do not put something else in that place, you will find yourself heading back to where you left or going back to the thing that you left off. Notice Numbers chapter 11, uh, verse 31. You was in 6 and 7. Notice verse 31. Because the children of Israel said, we got all this manna, but we want some meat. And so God again did another miracle. Verse 31, and there went out 
There went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on, that, on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubic high upon the face of the earth. Now you talk about quail. That's a lot of quail. Now, growing up in Missouri where I, where I used to hunt, we used to shoot bob whites. Some of you have seen them and they, they, they make that even that sound, bob white. So they whistle and it's nice to hear them talk in the evenings. Uh, but again, a covey would be anywhere from 6 to 12, 13. If you had a big covey, it might be 12 or 15. But when I worked in the church in California, out in California, I went out hunting out in the country, and they have some quail out there called mountain quail. Now, the mountain quail, they can be in, in massive, now, nothing like this, of course, but much bigger than, one time I had to stop the car because they, they covered, I mean, uh, I had to stop because they was crossing the road, and there must have been, I mean, either hundreds or thousands of them, but I mean, a big flock of them, as big as this, I mean, just as wide as this room, and walking across the road, I had to wait for them all to get out of the way. You say, why didn't you shoot them? I really wanted to, except it's illegal to shoot quail from the road, so, um, but, uh, and I didn't have permission to hunt right there, but I sure wanted to, because, I mean, they were right, there was hundreds of them right there. Now, in this case, I mean, they didn't just have them as far as you could see, but they were also piled high. Notice how high he said, he said again, that they, that they were, they were on top of each other, two cubics high. I mean, they had meat to eat and to spare, but they wanted something, and God gave it to them. Notice verse 32. The people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered the ten homers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. So I said, you've got to practice the law of replacement. God did that. God took away the, the leeks and the garlic and the stuff from Egypt, and he gave them manna, and he gave them quail. Now, if you, re, if you give up bad music, and by the way, if you have bad music, you ought to give it up. That's one of the reasons we always talk about when these fellows, when the, when the Lone Star crowd was in town, they had some good DVDs, is it DVDs or CDs? I never can't keep track of which one's which, but I know one of them is preaching and singing, the other one's music, but they had the, they had the music on the, on the table. By the way, that's a safe place to buy good music. You go to a Bible, even a Bible bookstore, if we even have one in town, and I don't know that we still do, if you go to a Bible bookstore, it's going to be hard to find good music at a Bible bookstore. That's why we always talk about that. And when Brother Coral comes, he'll be bringing some good music. You and I should have good music. Because, by the way, if you quit listening to bad music, you and I are musical in nature. We need, to have, we need to listen to good music. If we, if we give up, now again, I've never, as I said, I, I never smoked. Brother Vineyard gave up smoking, and he, was, he used either toothpicks or chewing gum because so, he said he used to reach in his pocket to grab that cigarette, so he would reach in his pocket and pull out the toothpick. So he always carried around, he always walked around with a toothpick in his, in his mouth. What he, what he was practicing was the law of replacement. He stopped one thing, and he put something else in his place. By the way, if you start, stop hanging out with the wrong crowd, you better start hanging out with the right crowd. If he used to always go to the, to, to say, say there was a certain night of the week that you always went someplace and did something bad, make that a night that you call, call around and find someone that can go knock doors with you. Uh, or we'll go over and, and start a, a game night with one of the other church members. Now, I can tell you there's some of the games that our people play that I'm not very good at. Say, Brother Block, are you pretty good at spelling? I am. But I don't have the patience for it like some of our folks do. I know that Betty and Dina play and Mrs. Bell and Miss Ridge and I think Mrs. Perry and some of the rest of them play the game. And I know the other day that the Castillo's asked me to come play a game with them, uh, but I'd never, now, I, there are some games I like to play, but there are some games I have no patience for because like, like chess, I know how to play chess, I just don't have the patience for chess. Sean loves chess, don't you, Sean? He'll only say, hey, Brother Block, you want to play chess? And I'll say, sure. He'll say, well, when? I said, not today. Uh, I, I would like to play, but just not now. Because Sean has the patience to, 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 to look at, and I, I know what he's doing. My problem is, while he's doing all that, I'm going to go get me a drink and something to eat and watch a little TV and then come back. And I, I didn't realize all of his because he'll do this. And he'll go, no, no. He'll do that for, I mean, and again, they set a timer. Uh, but you say, how long's the timer? I don't know, too long. That's how long the timer is, too long, okay? Um, I'm the kind of guy that, I mean, if I go to a restaurant and there's a line, uh, unless I'm with someone and they really want to eat there, I go someplace else. I mean, because I do not. You say, Brother Block, do you apply that almost everywhere? Almost everywhere. I go to amusement park. I might ride the kiddie ride three times instead of the big scary one once because I had to stand in line for an hour and a half for the big scary one. Now, I've rode, I've rode the big scary ones with the teenagers because they think it's hilarious to see the, see the youth director ride with them. I've run up the one where they clank, 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 go up three or four stories, go out a little ways, they hold you for just long enough so you can get scared, and then they drop you, okay? And you, you go down and you say, did you scream? No. All I was thinking of, this is really, really stupid. If this breaks, I'm going to go to heaven, and God's going to be shaking his head and going, really? 
Really? That's, I mean, that's how, that's how you got here? So, I mean, it takes all the fun out of riding a scary ride to Brother Block because I just can picture God saying, you know what, there's lots of ways you could have went, but that's about the dumbest thing I can think of right there. I picture the roller coaster going around those curves and then just flying off. You say, does it ever happen? Very rarely, but I always picture it happening to me. And so, and when I go upside down, and I hate to be turned upside down, I'm always holding on to my glasses and my hat trying to make sure I don't lose my glasses because I don't want to be the guy after the ride going around underneath the thing trying to find my glasses that fell off while I was up on the ride. So I don't enjoy those kinds of rides. Now, you want to get in the little one where you sit there and you spin that thing until people get sick? I can spin it with the best of them, all right? Uh, but, again, all those other rides do not excite me. But, again, understand, if you're going to replace, you're going to give something up, you've got to replace it with something else. Because uh, if, if Friday night was always your night to go out and hang out with the guys, then make Friday night the, the night you go out and hang out with the church folks. You say, well, what are we doing Friday night? Well, if you have nothing else to do, come to youth activities. I'm not a teenager. We'll put you to work. We'll let you, we'll let you help and run errands. But, again, it will keep you from hanging out with that other crowd that you shouldn't be hanging out with. You got to you got to use the, the, again the, the practice the law of replacement. Step number five: you must pro- practice the law of association. The law of association. Notice Exodus chapter twenty-five, verse eight. Exodus twenty-five, verse eight says, "And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them." Now this is God sp- God speaking. He said, "Make me a sanctuary." You know why? Because I want to dwell among them. Notice verse nine. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. He said, make me a tabernacle because I want to dwell right there in the middle of the children of Israel. Now listen to me. We want to practice the law of association. Spend times with the ones you want to be like. Don't, again, drop the old crowd. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, set the Lord and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. True separation means I get away from that old crowd, I get away from those old habits, and I put myself with the right crowd, and I I try to establish some good habits. Again, you must practice the law of association. Don't hang out with the old crowd. Now listen to me, if you used to drink, and you give up drinking, and you hang out with your drinking buddies, sooner or later, that that smell of alcohol is going out. You say, does alcohol smell good to you? No, it does not. I mean, it's... I asked someone one time, because as kids, we found a six-pack someone had put in the creek uh, to get code, and we found it before they did, and we took it to the house and showed mom and dad, and they said, go throw it away. So we'd, we thought we would, but we thought we'd open them one up first. So we, we had already shook them, we opened them up, and they sprayed all over us, and they smelled so bad. And I asked someone later, I said, does it taste as bad as it smells? And they said, yes, but if you drink enough of it, you'll get where you like it. And I thought to myself, well, that's probably true of a lot of stuff. I mean, I probably, if I, probably if I eat dog poop, I mean, I eat it often enough, I'd probably get to like it too, but I'm not going to eat dog poop. So again, you can't, you can't hang out with the old crowd. I'm, I know folks who gave up drinking and they had to change their route to work because they wanted to make sure they missed that old bar that they always went by. So they changed their route to work. They took a longer route to work so that they would not go by that place that had such a temptation or such a pull to them. And number six, he says, give God the praise for his deliverance. Give God the praise for his deliverance. By the way, he, sa- he said this, the more people who know a person is trying to gain victory over habit, the less apt you are to return. Now, I can tell you, when I got saved, I told the folks at school that I got saved, that I was going to quit doing this and this and this and this. Sometimes, and again, they were, they were, some of them were lost, but they were still, some of them were still my friends. Again, in a small school like I grew up in, we'd, I'd been with the same kids since kindergarten. Some of them I would do something or say something, and some of them would say something like this. Hey, I didn't know Christians were supposed to, I didn't know Christians did that. They would remind me that I wasn't supposed to be doing it. Oh, I thought you weren't going to do that anymore. I don't know how many of you have ever had that happen, but if you've declared yourself, and then, by the way, you do something you shouldn't do, there's sometimes a lost crowd or someone else will say, didn't think you, didn't think you went there anymore. I didn't think you did that stuff anymore. Didn't think you, you drank that anymore. Didn't think you said those things anymore. Again, um, Give God the praise for your deliverance. He gave some examples, and I'll give you these quickly, and I'll be done. He said, let's take the example of the bondage is gossip. If you have a problem with gossip, here's, he says, here's what to do. First off, admit you have a problem with gossip. Second, claim the law of freedom. Go to James chapter 3 in your Bibles. James chapter 3. Again, I told you you want to find a scripture to, to claim the law of freedom. You want to find a scripture that, that, that overpowers your flesh. Notice God's promise in James chapter 3, or God's word in James chapter 3, verse 6. The tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. So again, we want to make sure that we realize it's not something we should be doing. We go to God and say, God, you said that, this, that the tongue's a terrible thing. It can do some terrible stuff. I need deliverance from it. 
then he said, use the law of total separation. And here's what he said, stop running with the critics. Now, you hang around critical people, you'll be critical. The truth is, when you read Genesis, you'll see several times it'll say this, and they brought forth after their kind. You know who we hang out with? We hang out people of our own kind. Now, if you're, if you're trying to give up gossip, you don't want to hang out with critics. That's going to, that's going to cause you problems. You're going, to, you're going to find yourself just being critical. By the way, stop reading critical stuff. Again, he says, if you're trying to give up gossip, admit you have a problem. Find a verse, the law of freedom, law of total separation. Number four, law of replacement. So he said, instead of being critical, now you say to yourself, I will start praising people. Now, in the past, you complained about stuff. In the past, you complained about people. Now, you go out of your way to praise people. By the way, you, you say to yourself, I won't say anything unless it's something good. By the way, all parents told us that when we were kids. We didn't always practice that. But our parents used to always say, if you can't find something good to say about something, then don't say anything at all. By the way, that old principle is, is a good principle. Have you noticed that most of the principles that our parents used years ago, almost all of them came from the Bible? Some of them weren't even Christians, but it just had been in our culture and in our nature because our forefathers, I mean, founded most of the truths and most of the laws, by the way, uh, on the Word of God. But again, he said, again, hang out with people who are always praising the Lord. Hang out with people who always have good things to say, not folks who have bad. So the law of replacement. Then he said the law of association. So he said, again, I will only associate with, with positive people, someone who praises the Lord, someone who's living for the Lord and doing something for the Lord. Then he said at the end, when you give your testimony, the testimony will be, I'm so thankful that God's helped me with my sin of gossip. Now, you and I all have bad habits. Say, so didn't he give you any other examples? Yes, but I didn't really want to use the other one because it was closer to home. He gave another one called overeating. He said, when it comes to your bondage of overeating, I know none of us have that problem because all of us, I mean, we are all, I mean, as in good a shape as we should be. Praise the Lord. But here's what he said. He said, if you have a problem with overeating, he said, Admit you have that problem. I eat more, more than my body needs to be healthy. Sometimes I just struggle because I'm not sure how much my body needs to be healthy. So sometimes it varies. He said then claim the law of freedom. Notice Proverbs chapter 23. For the drunkard and the glutton, verse 21. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. What he says is it's not going to be good. The fellow who, who eats like a pig at the trough, I mean overeats all the time, it's not going to be pretty. He said then use the law of separation. I must stop going to fast food. And the ice cream part of it. I was so thankful I don't eat ice cream. See, I can go, yeah, that's one of the things I don't do. But he said, stop overeating. Quit going to fast food and the ice cream part of it. He said, step number four, the law of replacement. He said, I will replace those with fruit, salad, and drink lots of water. Basically all the things you didn't like before. Although I like fruit and salad. Step number five, he said, the law of association. Hang out with others who have controlled their appetites. He said, go to the gym instead of the bakery. And he said the testimony, the step number six, he said, give God the glory. By the way, uh, again, it's always a blessing when you can say, you know what, uh, I've, and again, I can tell you from all of us who are, are working to, to lose weight, anytime we lose a pound or two, we want to tell people because we want to, I mean, we are so excited because we lost a pound or two. Sometimes when people tell me they lost a pound or two, I will have to say to them, I know where it went. I have it. And so sometimes I found their pound or two that they lost. But what he said is when you have a problem, when you have a habit, and by the way, especially if you're younger, some of you young folks, you'll, you'll find yourself with some bad habits. Your parents haven't, uh, again, haven't beaten that out of you yet. Uh, it is a lot easier for you to give it up. It's a lot easier for you to decide to break that habit than for someone to make you break it. I can tell you, I always tell people this, if the rule uh, on the hair is it has to be here and here and here, cut your hair shorter than that. That way nobody's making you cut your hair. You're cutting your hair that way on purpose. If the school dress code was that the ladies' dress had to be at least right here, I told our girls, they say, I don't like anyone telling me what to do. That I said, well, then wear your dress a little longer. That way, we're not telling you what to do. You're wearing your dress longer because you want to wear it longer. And I can tell you, when I do something on my own, it was always more enjoyable than when my dad grabbed my ear or my dad grabbed my hair or my dad grabbed some other part of my body and drugged me to do the thing he told me to do. It was much easier to get there on my own. And by the way, I can tell you as a child of God, the devil doesn't want you happy, and the devil doesn't want you successful, and the devil doesn't want you pleasing and serving the Lord. So he's always going to just keep throwing stuff in front of us, try to keep us distracted from serving the Lord, keep us too busy to go soul winning, keep us where we have things to come up on Wednesday and Sunday, and, and, and keep us from, from uh, passing out tracts and giving us excuses for, for going by Bible standards. He's going, to, he's going to give us all kinds of reasons why we can't do things and live for the Lord. Because, by the way, times have changed. That used to be, you used to be able to do that 50 years ago, but you can't do that today. I can tell you this book is just as relevant today as it was back when it was translated in 1611. 
and just as relevant today as it was back when they, when they carried around the parchments and read it from there. It's still God's Word, and, and everything that's in it still applies today. And you and I as children of God need to make sure that we live in a way separate, different than what the world does. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you do help us. Lord, I know many of the men and women and girls and guys that are sitting in the pew tonight, Lord, they got saved, and then you did something in their lives. You changed them. We have folks here, Lord, that at one time they were what we would call the, the wrong crowd and the rowdy crowd and the bad crowd and the bad influence. But you saved them. And then after you saved them, Lord, you changed them. And they, and they worked to be, they didn't just, they didn't just, it didn't just happen. They worked to be changed because they wanted to please you. They wanted to be holy and godly. And they wanted to, to, be, to live in such a way that you could bless them. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to always have that on our minds, that we want to live in such a way that you can bless us. Lord, I know that sin drives a wedge between you and I. And sin causes where my prayers are not answered and, and my Christian life's more of a struggle. And I pray, Lord, you'd help each of us to realize that sin's not our friend. It never has been. It never will be. The devil's not our friend. He'll, he'll try to act like he's our friend, but he just does that to trick us and mess with us because he's a liar and a deceiver. I pray, Lord, you'd help us work hard on cleaning our lives up and living in such a way that we might glorify you. And ultimately, when we die and go to heaven, we would hear 